This episode is dedicated by Time Ghost Army Brigadier Stephen Przybilski to the memory of the countless Poles who bravely assisted the Armia Krajowa before and during the Warsaw Uprising. More on that later. October 7th, 1944. The world has been watching. For two months, the whole world has watched the men and women of Poland rise up against the German occupiers in Warsaw. The uprising has been bloody beyond belief, and the death toll for all sides together is likely over 200,000 in just these short weeks. But this week, the Warsaw Uprising ends. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Operation Market Garden ended, and with it, the hopes of quickly breaking through the German defenses in the West. The Soviets launched attacks in the Estonian islands, the Allies advanced to Italy, the Warsaw Uprising was on its last legs, the Marines advanced on Peleliu, and machinations between Chiang Kai-shek and Vinegar Joe Stilwell for power continued. The ballad of Chang and Vinegar Joe continues this week with U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt giving a rather frank assessment. If you'll recall, Stilwell had used Roosevelt's fear of a disaster in Burma to get him to write an ultimatum to Chang for Stilwell to be put in total charge of all of Chang's forces. I'm going to quote Rana Mitter about that. Totally breaking the timeline, too. The delivery of Roosevelt's note was a watershed. For this short moment of satisfaction, Stilwell would pay a very heavy price. U.S.-China relations for the next quarter century would pay an even heavier one. Arguably, they're still paying some of that price today. That book came out in 2013. Brilliant book. But the relationship between the U.S. and China has undeniably gone south. A lot of Americans now view Chang's government as not only corrupt and ungrateful, but of no real importance now that the Allies are advancing in Western Europe. Many of the Chinese see the Americans as a burden, thousands and thousands of troops who are not even actually fighting in China, and don't really see that China is actually under siege. Roosevelt tells Chang that the flow of supplies over the hump is so important that still will be placed in direct command under you of the Chinese forces in Burma and of all Chinese ground forces in Yunnan province. Okay, he agrees with Chang that Stilwell should no longer be Chang's chief of staff, nor, importantly, should have continued authority over Lend Lease. He does warn, though, that should he remove Stilwell entirely, it could lead to very serious results. Stilwell actually sees this message today, the 7th, which he finds encouraging since he's recently realized that all his comments about there never being any chance of him ever cooperating with Chang may in fact lead to his recall. We'll see what Chang says next week, I imagine. Chang does, of course, still very much have a fight on his hands in China. Actually, joint Japanese operations against Liu Xiao and Guilin began generally last week on the 29th. Now, the Japanese plan for this phase of battle is to connect their forces in Indochina with those in China, and is strung out over four provinces, which is roughly equal to the size of France, Germany, and Italy altogether. For this purpose, a new force called the Six Area Army was set up on August 26 under the command of General Okamura. It embraced the unprecedented number of 350,000 soldiers in the 11th, 34th and 23rd armies, reinforced by three air regiments. These reinforcements included the Type 4 fighters, which allowed the Japanese to reactivate their river craft for use during the coming campaign. See, it's the rainy season in China, which means, one, river levels are higher and it's easier to use boats, but two, Chinese and American planes are grounded more often and can't hassle the Japanese boats. The Japanese aren't using much armor since many bridges are destroyed, and once the rains stop, the enemy planes will be back. Just now, also, the rains are especially heavy, hindering any land movement. There have been issues in Japanese command. 11th Army, after its victory at Changsha in June, has been advancing to get more glory against direct orders to not do so and advanced into Ling Ling early in September. So there is real friction between 11th Army and 6th Area Army, of which it is but a part. In fact, for the current operation, 
which can't do much with the current weather. 23rd Army has orders direct from Okamura to take Lu Zhao, and 11th has orders to not do so and just to destroy the enemy where they encounter them. There is one Japanese success this week further north. Xiaoyang, west of Hengyang, has held out under siege for 38 days, but surrenders now on the 3rd. The Chinese there might be giving in, but on Peleliu, the Japanese are still holding out. The U.S. 7th Marines do make some attacks this week on the Japanese positions in the Umar Brogol Mountains, but after a couple weeks here, they've taken 1,486 casualties out of 3,217 men landed, which is 46%, and their battalions are down nearly to company strength. They are relieved by the 5th Marines starting from the 5th. See, the 4th, the 7th, attacks the east side of the Umar Brogo pocket, in which the remaining 6,000 or so Japanese are trapped. They have a battalion of the 5th Marines backing them up, and they take Walt and Boyd Ridges along the vital supply road. But also take absolutely devastating casualties, leaving the 5th Marine Regiment to carry on for the Marines. Its commander, Harold Harris, does not plan on constant attacks on the enemy despite pressure from headquarters, since the enemy is no threat anywhere else. His plan is to slowly and methodically reduce the enemy, which it looks like is what's gonna also have to happen in Western Europe to beat the Germans. Now, on the 2nd, U.S. 1st Army begins new attacks between Aachen and Geilenkirchen, its 30th Division from 19th Corps, who begins the assault on the West Wall. This is no news to them since they've had postponements for the last two weeks. The attack is on a front of like one and a half kilometers along the Würm. Division Commander Leland Hobbs very much wants to avoid urban traps and holdups while following a route that is still easy to supply. He also has some trepidation about the aerial assault to precede the attacks, since as we saw in Normandy, 30th Division was hit hard by Allied bombers near saint lô taking nearly 600 casualties. And they know that the Germans pretty much expect an attack on the first clear day. And it's also pretty clear that the blow will fall between Geilenkirchen and Aachen. Or is it? The Americans need not have concerned themselves with this problem, for German intelligence officers could not see the forest for the trees. So concerned were they with fear of a major American offensive on a broad front southeast of Aachen that they failed to accord any real importance to the preparations in the Geilenkirchen sector. At 9 a.m., the airstrikes begin. They do not drop short. They overshoot. 19th Corps attacks. The Worm is only a river in name, being less than two meters deep, so the men can cross it on duckboards. Tanks cannot come until the evening, though, because the mud of the banks is a quagmire, so the first day nets some small gains and a tenuous bridgehead. The Germans, though, aren't even ready to counterattack until the 4th, by which time the Americans have made a decent advance. German counterattacks the 6th are strong, but fail, and by today, the Americans are ready to exploit their bridgehead and secure it with a wall of armor. Hobbs reports today to command that 19th Corps' battle to breach the West Wall is over. We have a hole in this thing big enough to drive two divisions through. The bridgehead is 10 kilometers long and eight deep. Up near the coast, on the third, RAF bombers breach the dikes around Valkeren Island. This floods much of the island and is supposed to weaken the German defenses. 247 planes hit the dikes, apparently using the same dam buster bombs used on the Mona Dam. 100 meters of dike is destroyed and the inrushing sea kills 125 islanders and the central lagoon slowly filling also kills a couple thousand horses and as many as 9,000 cattle who are unable to swim and climb to safety. On the 6th, Canadian 2nd Corps begins trying to eliminate the enemy south of the Scheldt. Today they managed to get some men on two bridgeheads across the Leopold Canal, but are stopped there. On the 7th, American planes bomb and destroy the bridge at Arnhem. The Germans have been using this bridge to bring over armor to bring force to bear against the island, that area between the Meuse and the Lower Rhine, held by the 43rd Wessex and US 82nd Airborne Divisions. That bridge, you'll remember, was the target to capture last week in Market Garden. 
The fighting for that Nijmegen salient lasts all week. On both the first and the second, the Germans launch major attacks, both of which are repelled with heavy casualties, and Allied airstrikes target their assembly areas from the second. British counterattacks are bloody but effective over the next couple days, and by the fifth, the Germans have pulled back to their start position, the Veteran Canal. Their only decent defensive position and 10th SS Panzer Division is in a dire state. Attacks by the 9th and 116th Panzer Divisions against the Americans late in the week are also failures. The week ends with a lull in the battle and a look into the future. The major fighting ends tomorrow and the Germans have little to show for big losses but the armor can't provide close support for the infantry over the marshy terrain. On the 9th, OB West asks OKW if they can abandon the Arnhem Bridgehead, but they say no. Instead, 10th SS is ordered to establish a defensive position south of Arnhem and along the Linga Canal. The other forces will be slowly removed from the area. The Allies do not make further attempts to enlarge the Nijmegen Bridgehead. The emphasis now will be on clearing the Scheldt Estuary. The emphasis in Italy is now Bologna. And U.S. 5th Army begins its Bologna offensive. 2nd Corps, U.S. 2nd Corps, makes quick advances until the 4th because of the Germans pulling back. But from then, they're manning the Loiano line. After a hard fight over a couple days, the Germans pull back again and redeploy between Loiano and the Livorniano Escarpment, a formidable position. A manpower crisis in British 8th Army in Italy has led to disbanding the 1st Armored Division and reorganizing infantry battalions into just three companies. Also, the continued drive up the coast will be a secondary action, and Canadian 1st Corps and British 5th Corps will also head towards Bologna on their left flank. Planned crossings of the Rubicon this week are cancelled by heavy rains, but the Indian 10th Division finally makes a crossing the 6th, and the British 46th Division today. But no one crosses the Vistula this week. So in Warsaw, the Poles have not been able to create an operational link with the Red Army. There's no longer any hope of a Soviet assault on Warsaw, and the Allied planes have left the skies over the city, and the Warsaw Uprising comes to an end. After two months of merciless fighting, 62 days of unending horror and atrocity, with 15,000 men of the 30 to 40,000 of the Armia Krajowa dead, the population forcibly evacuated or murdered on the spot, 150 to 200,000 civilians immolated out of 1 million, surrender could no longer be delayed. On October 2nd, the fighting ceased. The Poles were collected for deportation or extinction in the gas chambers, after which the Germans bent to the maniacal labor of burning Warsaw to the ground. The German command reckoned 10,000 dead, 7,000 missing, and another 9,000 wounded. As for the ongoing Slovak national uprising, Stavka orders the 2nd Parachute Brigade from the 1st Czechoslovak Corps to drop in to help it, and the main body arrives in Slovakia this week. That's just 700 men but they have 104 tons of equipment with them. They deploy near Banska Stiavnica, and more men and more stuff will arrive over the next couple of weeks. As for Kirill Moskalenko's 38th Army, that's been trying to force the Duke La Pass for weeks now, after five days of heavy fighting in the mist and the rain, 1st Czechoslovak Corps finally takes the pass, the 6th. Things are generally looking up for the Slovaks and Czechs this week. General Viest comes over from London to take command of the 1st Czechoslovak Army at Banska Bystrica. The troops are fighting on their own soil. But you know, war is war. And Heinrich Himmler arrived in Bratislava at the end of last week. And this week has a conference in Vienna where he lays out the plans to crush the uprising. There is an element of speed to this. It needs to be done quickly. I mean, what if the Red Army does link up with the rebels and they're reinforced? A drive into Hungary? Moravia? Hungary has become a real source of concern since the Germans are aware that their only remaining active ally in the fight is in many cases not only unwilling to fight, 
but part of Hungarian command is actively trying to get out of the war. So the plan is for seven divisions, some 45,000 men, with armor, artillery, and aircraft to get in and do the job. It will likely take them more than a week to get ready for the attacks, though. And more on Hungarian politics next week. As for the war in Hungary, Rodion Malinovsky's second Ukrainian front launches their Debrecen Operation the 5th, crossing the Hungarian-Romanian border in force north and west of Arad. This is part of a pretty ambitious plan. While those armies are to cross the Tisza and strike at Budapest, Six Guards Tank Army on the right is to attack past Oradea towards Debrecen and eventually link up with 4th Ukrainian Front spearheads. If they can close those pincers, it will trap a lot of Army Group South, 1st Panzer Army and Hungarian 1st Army. The plan was ambitious, too ambitious. Men and material for one extensive buildup were not to be had at this late stage of the general summer offensive. Both fronts were feeling the effects of combat and long marches, and their supply lines were overextended. Because of the difference in gauges, the Romanian railroads, if anything, were serving the Russians less well than they had the Germans, and 2nd Ukrainian Front had to rely mainly on motor transport west of the Dniester. They are still trying, though. But for all the success near Arad, Six Guards tank army is stopped at Oradia. The Soviets enter Yugoslavia in force this week, and on the 4th, 3rd Ukrainian Front forces take Panchevo on the Danube, just east of Belgrade. The Belgrade attacks are still in their opening moves, but there's the issue of coordinating the forces involved, which are Yugoslav, Soviet, and Bulgarian. Now on the 5th is a meeting in Krajowa between Soviet General Sergei Beryutsov, Yugoslavia's Marshal Tito, and a Bulgarian delegation under Dobri Terpeshev of Bulgaria's Fatherland Front. One big thing is to work out an armistice between Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. Tito and company have repeatedly said they need more time to convince their people that this is a new Bulgaria, since the Yugoslavians were pretty badly treated, to put it mildly, by Bulgarian occupation forces. People have to believe that this is an ally and not an enemy. To be clear though, no one here is suggesting holding the Bulgarian people responsible for the acts and orders of their former government, nor is anyone suggesting that they do not now need Bulgarian troops. By the evening, Terpeshev got his armistice and thus refurbished the honor of Bulgaria. Beryatsov pocketed the tripartite military agreement, now signed and sealed. While Tito could be well satisfied that this self-same document safeguarded the independent status of each national army and in no way infringed national sovereignty. On the 6th, Tito sends orders to his first army group to attack towards Obrenovac, since he really wants to enter Belgrade before the Soviets, but the Yugoslav forces are pushed back. Meanwhile, Soviet 57th Army, with 75th Corps attached, has been fighting early in the week towards the Morava, and on the 4th makes contact with a Yugoslavian brigade from 25th Division. They then begin to coordinate plans to cut off the German escape from the Balkans. And up in the far north, the Germans are worrying about what to do with their guys up there. 20th Mountain Army is currently in northern Finland, but German command no longer thinks holding northern Finland is worth the effort, so they decide the third they will execute Operation Nordlicht. As an expedition by a 200,000 man army, with all of its equipment and supplies, across the Arctic in winter, it had no parallel in military history. Be that as it may, they shall try it. But the Soviets forced the issue by attacking the 19th Mountain Corps who've been east of Pechenga since the summer of 1941, today on the 7th. The Soviets hit the 53,000 or so men of the Corps with 97,000 men in five rifle corps. Since they're also backed by artillery, planes, and even tanks, they overwhelm a few strong points straight off and threaten to cut the Arctic Ocean Highway, the Germans' main evacuation route. In the Baltic, the Soviet moonsund operation to take the western Estonian islands continues. The Soviets thought they could take all the islands by the 5th, 
but German defenses and bad weather prevents this. However, after securing Dago or Hiuma Island the third, they do manage a beachhead on the fifth on the north of Ursel or Sarema Island near Yani. The Germans withdraw across the island and will defend at the Serve Peninsula to the south. By tomorrow, all the German forces will be here. They will hold out in strong defenses for several weeks against many Soviet attacks. There is new fighting this week on the continent in the Baltics as well. Okay, I mentioned last week that there was a race going on between the Germans and the Soviets in Latvia and Lithuania to set up new front lines. If the Germans, or Army Group North Commander Ferdinand Schoener, win it, they'll have a secure line from Yelgava down to Tilsit, solidly secure in East Prussia and with anchors at Tukums and Kelmi. Should the Soviets then try a strike into East Prussia, they'll get hit hard in the flank. The Soviets, for their part, ordered a new offensive prepared with the weight on their overall left flank towards a Memel axis. Ivan Bagramian's first Baltic front is to shift its right flank armies from around Riga to around Shaoyai and then attack towards Memel and the mouth of the Niemen. If successful, this would cut off Army Group North from East Prussia for good, and 2nd and 3rd Baltic fronts could take their time in taking Riga. In just six days, Bagramian has managed to swing his whole front around and redeploy north of Shaoyai, and 2nd Baltic takes over what was the right of 1st Baltic sector. So they moved over half a million men 10,000 artillery pieces, and over a thousand tanks just like that. Bagramian's plan is to break into the German defenses on his left wing in two sectors, and it is not until the second that the Germans figure out what's been going on. But then it might be too late. There are like only five German divisions facing Bagramian's assault armies. Schoener's divisions are between the Gulf of Riga and the libau shalia Railway and falling back into Courland. Meanwhile, 2nd and 3rd Baltic fronts are making attacks against the Sigulda defense line further east with the sole purpose of preventing Schoener from pulling away any force from there. Fog prevents any real recon for the next couple days and then at 11.10 the 5th, the Soviets attack. They cannot use any planes or artillery because of the lingering fog. And they don't get the armor out that day either. On the 6th, the tanks do head out through the rain and mud to join the 190 kilometer battlefront. German command is well aware of the dangers of encirclement. So they're pulling back force from around Riga the night of the 6th, meaning 2nd and 3rd Baltics can advance today, the 7th. Scharner needed more men. But with East Prussia now visibly threatened by 3rd Belarusian Front, the German command could not release a single division. With the Soviet offensive developing along multiple axes towards Memel, Riga, and the Moon Islands, the available German forces were pinned down across a huge arc. No longer could reserves be switched almost at will. And the week comes to an end. With border crossings in Yugoslavia, Hungary and Germany. Germans may be trapped in Finland and Courland, but Japanese definitely trapped on Peleliu, the Warsaw Uprising ending, and things going slowly in Italy and in the West. What does all this do to your head if you've been in the actual fight? Martin Gilbert writes in the Second World War, the British had been at war with Germany for more than five years, the Russians for more than three years, and the Americans for nearly three years. The strain of so prolonged a conflict had long been evident to the commanders of every army. On the 4th, Dwight Eisenhower sends out to all combat units in Europe under his command a report from the U.S. Surgeon General, which addresses just this. The report reads, The key to an understanding of the psychiatric problem is the simple fact that the danger of being killed or maimed imposes a strain so great that it causes men to break down. One look at the shrunken, apathetic faces of psychiatric patients as they come down stumbling into the medical station, sobbing, trembling, referring shudderingly to them shells, and to buddies mutilated or dead is enough to convince most observers of this fact. It also explains to all that it is impossible to get used to combat. You can't. Everyone knows that at any moment you might be killed or the guy next to you might have his head blown off. And each of these moments 
adds cumulative strain that will break down a man as inevitably as bullets and shells will. There are some figures in the report. The Americans estimate that in Italy, an infantryman can last around 200 combat days. The British pull their men out of the lines for rest for four days after each 12, and they think their men could last maybe 400 such days. There's also this. A wound or an injury is regarded not as a misfortune, but a blessing. As one litter bearer put it, something funny about the men you bring back wounded. They're always happy. They're sure glad to be getting out of there. That's where we are in 1944. Getting shot makes you happy. Getting shot is a good thing. What a year. I mentioned that this episode is supported by Time Ghost Army Brigadier Stephen Pshibilski. He dedicates it to all the Poles who assisted the underground forces throughout the occupation and uprising. But more specifically, he dedicates it to his grandmother, Helena Kolasa. Helena was born in 1900, the third of five children. In 1922, she married a Polish army officer, Władysław Kolasa. He had been decorated for valor in both the Polish army and the Great War Imperial Russian Army. In 1936, the family moved to Piotrkov Trybunalski, about 140 kilometers southeast of Warsaw. However, expecting their two then-teenage children to finish high school in Warsaw, they kept their house there. In the spring of 1939, Władysław landed an executive position that fatefully came with a car and a chauffeur, which was a very rare perk at that time and place. So, Two days after Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939, Piotrkov was bombed. In the shock and chaos of the moment, it was agreed that Władysław would immediately take the children to the presumed safety of Warsaw and then return for Helena and their most important belongings the next day. Three times he tried to return for his wife, but was repulsed each time by the crush of refugees fleeing the Nazi onslaught. On the 7th, with the Germans advancing on Warsaw and Piotrkov having already fallen, Władysław decided to take the kids and head for Romania. Helena, alone in an occupied Poland and without means of support, did not even know whether her family was dead or alive. It was not until 1940 that she learned her family had miraculously made it out of Poland and eventually to France. Helena made her way to the family's house in Warsaw. Fiercely patriotic, she did what she could to help the resistance. She was a courier for the underground government, and she took in, fed, and nursed to health escaped and wounded fighters. Of course, the penalty for being caught doing any of these was death. During the Warsaw Uprising, she was among those running documents and news among the pockets of resistance through the sewers. After the war, Helena will be able to join her daughter Maria and her family in Canada. But perhaps because her heart is so strongly tied to Poland, she will never feel quite at home there, and she will return to her beloved homeland in 1964 and will pass away in 1966. If you want to memorialize someone or something about World War II, join the Time Ghost Army at the Brigadier level for one year or go to patreon.com to reserve a memorial through a one-time contribution. And do not forget to subscribe, and I will see you next time.